Hi everyone, I'm Zach Rubin and here today with Liz Wiseman who will be exploring the different characteristics that separate the leaders that bring out the most from people versus those that bring out the least. Um, thanks so much for being with us today, Liz. Oh, you're welcome. Um... Um, and just a couple notes on the presentation today. Um, there will be time at the end for questions. So if you have anything you'd like to ask Liz, please use the ask a question button. We'll also be doing some poll questions. Um, so um, we'll, we'll come to that in the presentation, but in the resources section of the page, you'll see the link for that. Um, I'll give a quick introduction for Liz and then she'll be able to kick us off. Liz Wiseman is a researcher and the executive advisor who teaches uh, leadership to executives around the world. She's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, and the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Rookie Smarts, Why Learning Beats Knowing in the New Game of Work. Liz is the CEO of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development firm headquartered in Silicon Valley. And Liz has been listed on the Thinkers 50 ranking and in 2019 was recognized as the top leadership thinker in the world, which I personally find very impressive, Liz. Um, I'll hand it over to you and we'll uh, jump right in. Okay, um, Zach, thank you. <clears throat> and thanks to everyone who is Who work for you and and in turn for them creating an environment where they get to work at their best and creating an environment that they might say is challenging maybe even a little bit exhausting but totally exhilarating creating really a great place to work where people do great work now i want to frame our conversation today in in the question <clears throat> and the question we're going to explore is how do you lead so that you get all of the intelligence inside of your organization? How do you really create an intelligent organization where, of course, people can think and act with reason and solve hard, complex problems, but also an organization that can change and adapt, which is really, as the researchers would, researchers would say, it's like the ultimate form of intelligence. How do you create an organization that can innovate and adapt and change faster than the world around you is changing? Now, my research on this, it began with two, I think, very simple observations that I, I had when I was working as an executive at Oracle Corporation. And, and the first observation was that there seemed to be more intelligence. And, you know, and by intelligence, I mean know-how, capability, talent, more intellect inside of our work teams than most managers were using that companies worked really, really hard to hire smart people, to recruit the best talent out of the best universities. They worked hard to hire smart people, but a lot of people were overworked but underutilized. But they didn't, these managers didn't work as hard to utilize the talent that they had worked so hard to recruit. See, I think it's one of the little I don't know, maybe it's even a dirty little secret of the corporate world, is that there's more intelligence um, than is being used, that there's a lot of people who are overworked but underutilized. You know, they're coming into the office knowing they have more capability than is being used, than is being seen, and for some, more than is being allowed. Now, there's a lot of people who are busy but bored, and I want to start, we're going to do a number of polls today, but we're also going to do some chatting and I'm, I'm, we're going to ask you to chat with us. Now there's a question function on your, um, your, your, your platform here. And I would love to have you um, answer the question. What is it like to be overworked and simultaneously underutilized? What's it like to be overworked and underutilized? And, um, Zach is going to be looking at this. I'm going to take a look at this. Um, I'd love to have you put your fingers on the keyboard. We're going to do this a number of times throughout the webinar. So we're going to test it out now. What is it like in a word or two? So you don't need to write an essay. What is it like to be overworked and underutilized? We're just going to test out, make sure this function's working okay. And Zach, you tell me if you see anything. I don't see anything coming through on the 
the guest chat. Liz, I've got the chat up. I don't know if you can see that the way you have the slides. Um, but we people should be able to enter their questions in. They might just take a second. Oh, we've got a bunch. Here we go. Um, so uh, Julie says it feels like you're running the place. Um, Britta says demoralized. Josh says super frustrating. Another frustrating. Um, a lot of frustratings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> frustrating was the number one word that came up in my research as I looked at this people said it is frustrating and it's exhausting and I found it so interesting that people e experience exhaustion when they're underutilized I think it tells us something about how we're built and how we're built for work so anyway this was my first observation that there's a lot of underutilized but overworked people now the second observation was that some leaders seem to see this available, if not latent intelligence better than others. I came to call them multipliers. These are leaders who see and use all of the capability around them. They're, they're leaders around whom we tend to be at our very best. They're leaders around whom people say, yeah, it was a little bit exhausting, but totally exhilarating working for this person. Um, the other observation is, you know, there's a lot of smart people when they go into leadership, they end up sucking the smarts right out of their team. And I think everyone's experienced this. These are leaders who use their intelligence more as a, a weapon than a tool. And I came to call them diminishers. I just want you to anchor back to someone around whom you were at your best, a multiplier, and someone who made you hold back, play it safe, or someone that you felt very underutilized around. I've got four questions for you. We're going to um, chat these in and we're going to use a couple of polls, but let me just briefly cover the questions. I'm going to ask you to think about this diminisher first. And the first question I have for you is what did that diminisher do? And I'm going to have you use that question function, just like you did before, to just write in what did you notice about that diminisher's behavior? Now, of course, don't share any names. We don't want to know any of that, but we'd love to have you describe the behavior in a sentence or a phrase or maybe even a single word. Now, the second question, we're going to use a poll to do it, and I'm going to ask you to quantify how much of your intelligence did this leader get from you? And it's a tricky question in that I'm not asking you how hard you were working. You could have been working extremely hard. I'm asking you how much of your mind, your brain was being utilized, you know, based on the way he or she led, okay? Um, we'll use a poll for that, and then we're going to do the same thing for the multiplier. But what I want you to start with is this first question. Chat it in using that question, that ask a question function. What did your diminisher do? And Zach, why don't you go ahead and um, I've got the chat window up, but for some reason, the, the stream of responses isn't coming through on my screen. Um, so why don't you tell us, what do you see in this? Um, Absolutely. And you can summarize it or maybe cherry pick a few things that are interesting. And if you're out there listening, you know, you can keep sending in comments about what did these leaders do? Just waiting for some comments to come in. Um, I've got one. Um, the leader is very controlling, a micromanager, didn't welcome conversation. Uh, took away responsibilities that the person once held. Um, the person people have had to continually justify all their actions um, to that new to that diminisher manager. And I also just want to chime in that poll, that first poll question is open for folks. And I can see we've got several people have already um, started answering that. So um, if people just click on the poll question, they'll see um, um, th they'll see that first question up and be able to answer that. Okay. Yeah. So you're either chatting in, what did your diminisher do? Or you're going to um, answer this question. How much of your intelligence did that diminisher get from you on the poll? Zach, anything else that's coming in on chat that would describe the behavior of these diminishing leaders? Yes. And as you're listening and Zach is describing people's experience with these diminishers, feel free to be 
to sum it up, maybe in a word, like if you had to come up with one word to describe what these leaders do that cause people to hold back, play it safe, be underutilized, feel frustrated, exhausted even, um, what would that word be? Zach, anything else that you see there? We've, we've got a, a couple dozen came in all, all together. So um, uh, no trust, um, wishy-washy and volatile, um, uh, bullied me, demeaned me, um, gave work that was menial and distasteful. Um, there, there, there's a lot here. Um, micromanaged <laughs> daily work, uh, focused on the small number of things that weren't meeting expectations instead of everything that was going well, uh, perpetuated tasks that were redundant, um, didn't ask for people's opinions, um, acted like they knew everything, uh, didn't think the consequences of their actions through, um, being overly critical. They, they keep coming in. Um, well, they keep, and you know what, and feel free if you're, I mean, for those listening, keep, keep this going, if not purely for the therapeutic value of this. <laughs> and um, Zach, anything else that just strikes you in that? Um, you know, a couple a couple that are a little different, just talking about busy work or or meaningless or menial work keeps kind of coming up. In addition to just the the micromanaging, I would say is the other huge theme here. Um, extreme micromanaging is coming up several uh, from several folks too. So micromanaging is the word that came up most frequently in in my research. You know, when we are in micromanaging mode, we are almost certainly having a diminishing impact. And, you know, Zach, I like the distinction you made because we find that these diminishers, sometimes they come in the form of these um, tyrannical bullies. And we heard some of this. They were demeaning, they bullied. But we can do this in a very um, seemingly innocuous way by just giving people busy work or meaningful tasks, maybe even thinking, okay, they're brand new out of college. Let's just, let's ramp them up slowly. Or gee, I don't want to like give them too much. Let me just give them some of the lightweight work and we can end up having a diminishing impact sometimes with the best of intentions. Okay, what do we see in that poll? If you had to calculate it's a little bit of a weighted average there, what does it what does it look like to you? So most most people are um, saying 40 to 60 percent. Um, we've got a few people at the no one's at 81 to 100. A few people have said 61 to 80 and then everyone else is either zero to 20 or or 21 to 40. So mm. not not looking great. Yeah, it's very consistent with what I found in my research when I asked people what did. And of course, I did my research blind and controlled. So I'm not using this term diminisher. When I ask people about these type of leaders, we find that they get less than half of people's available intelligence, their insight, their talent, their know-how. You know, they're they're hiring people, of course, for their capability, but then they're underutilizing them. And I think it's so interesting that companies are paying, working so hard to hire people, paying them full market value, full price, if you would, um, so to speak, but then these managers are using less than half of their capability. Like half of that is going to waste. But let's talk about, now some of you may be still chatting in about your diminisher. I'm gonna ask you to lighten it up a little bit. And I wanna to go to this question. What did your multiplier leader do? So let's go ahead and stop with the chatting about the diminishing leader. Think about that leader who brought out the absolute best in you. Someone that you not only felt brilliant around, you were, you were brilliant around, you did your best work around this leader. And would you do the same thing? Would you use that question function to answer what did the multiplier do? And then I think somewhere, Zach is probably gonna pop up that poll question as well. It's the same question, we're just now doing it for the multiplier. Fill up that chat stream. And um, Zach, tell us what you start to see. I know you're doing a lot of things right now because I'm a little blind to what's happening on chat so thanks for doing that for me so all of our all of our respondents so far have said the multiplier got the 80 to 100 percent of their intelligence so um let me jump to the question or the comments that are coming in let's see what we have here um so these are are all more positive um, um encouraged and promoted initiative um Offer or challenged yet offered structured support, asked their opinion and listened, had discussions on what could work and what will work, um, gave more responsibility over time and let them be part of larger projects, um, 
gave clear direction, but left the how to get there to the team as they supported them. And then believe they were capable of more than than they were thought possible than than the person yeah. actually thought was possible. Yeah, which is getting into the assumptions that these leaders hold. And some of you are going to be still chatting in what did your diminisher do? But I would also invite you to to chat in a little a slightly different question. And the question is, what did that boss or teacher or coach that got so much from you, what did they believe to be true? about you, about them, about work? Like, what was one of their, um, it's kind of a bit of a worldview, a mindset, if you will. What's the assumption that they hold? Uh, we've already heard one of them, which is they believed I could do more than I thought I could do. That's often an assumption that these um, leaders hold. So feel free to send those in. And Zaxi, is, uh, tell us if you see anything interesting. Well, for me, it's all, as a researcher, it's all interesting. But what do you notice? Um, one great one from Lynn here, um, cast a strong vision and let them assist in working towards that vision. Mm. And then, um, okay. discern, discerning strengths and helping people focus their, their efforts towards those strengths. It's like those leaders determine the, what needs to be done, but they don't tell people how to do it. It's something I hear pretty consistently about I, the best leaders. I, I like this one, that, that people's intentions are positive overall, which kind of comes to the opposite of the, the micromanaging where you assume that people might be slacking off or they have no idea what they're doing. Um, as yeah, I've got to do it. Yeah. I got to do it for them. They don't know how to do it. They're not going to do it right. My way is the right way. You know, the diminishers tend to hold this assumption that nobody's going to figure it out without me, without my intervention without my know-how without my guidance even or sometimes even just as subtle as without my help whereas the multipliers tend to hold this belief that you know fundamentally people are smart and they want to do a good job they have good intentions they're smart and they can figure it out it tends to be the mindset now we saw that most of the people are saying somewhere between 80 to 100%. Um, now, before I move on, Zach, anything else that you see interesting on chat? Um, this is this is another good one, also from Lynn. Thank you for these insights. Um, that the the leader knows that they need the team to get the work done, and they understand that they don't know everything. Hmm. Yeah, that maybe their own knowledge is helpful, but it's not. It's necessary, but not sufficient. That really you need all those different perspectives. They, these multiplier leaders tend to hold this very multi-dimensional or technicolor view of intelligence. You know, instead of asking, gee, is this person smart? And I know that most of us here on this broadcast have asked that question. I know I have like, oh man, is this, is this guy smart or not? They ask a different question. They're asking in what way is this person smart? Like, what is the unique intelligence that people bring to a team? And we actually need all of it to be able to solve this problem. Here's what I found in the research. And now, Zach, feel free to interrupt if I'm going to share what I found in the research. But if you see something really interesting come on chat, I, I, like, I want to share it with, with everyone on, on the line. So jump in if you see it. Will do. I'm going to switch Here's off the poll to your slides again, Liz, so everyone okay. will be able to see this now. Here's what I found in this research, studying these leaders that had a diminishing effect versus this multiplying effect, these leaders who got so much more from people. As we found, it starts with these very different mindsets. The diminisher thinking no one's going to figure it out without me versus the multiplier who holds this belief that people are smart and will figure it out. Now, I sometimes like to say, hey, you know what? You can skip the book. You can skip the webinar. You can skip the workshop. Uh, you know, skip me. You don't need any other guidance, but what if you just came into work every day with the assumption that the people who work for you are smart and will figure it out? <laughs> or if you happen to be working for a diminishing leader, like maybe what you need to do is just continue to remind them that you know what, you're smart and you're gonna figure this out. Okay, here's what I found that diminishers and multipliers do very differently. They do a lot of things alike. You know, they're both customer oriented, they both have vision, et cetera. 
here are the differences. The first is how they manage talent. The diminisher tends to be an empire builder and that they like to collect talent and then underutilize it. The multiplier, I call it a talent magnet because they do more than, than just scout talent. They do more than hire smart people. They deeply utilize people for their, what I call their native genius. Like that thing that their mind is just built to do. It's the thing they do better than anything other um, that they do. They do it better than others. It's like just that, it's like even more than a strength. It's like just a super native strength. They see that and they put it to work, not on small pet projects. They, they put people's native genius to work on the biggest, most important projects of the organization. And you know, that's a pretty good job where you get to come to work, where your unique intelligence is seen and appreciated and challenged and put to work and, and spotlighted and celebrated. Like most people love working in that kind of environment. And the second difference is the environment that they create. The diminisher tends to create an environment of stress. You know, they become tyrants and they don't have to be yelling, chair throwing, hot headed kinds of bullies. They just create stress. And we know, you know, who's taken the psychology course probably remembers like what happens when the amygdala, you know, senses anxiety or stress, it hijacks the neocortex of our brains. We basically, we, we stop thinking or, you know, we kind of get dumb for a moment. And as actually it's take, I think it was at 18 minutes for us to reboot that part of our brain that does all of the critical thinking, um, tough decisions, trade-offs, analysis, when we've had that amygdala hijack. Anyway, the diminishers create an environment of stress where the multipliers create an environment of, of safety, of space. They give other people space to do their best thinking. They create intellectual safety around them. They create psychological safety around them per like, the work that Amy Edmondson is doing at the Harvard Business School about like what happens when people feel psychologically and intellectually safe with each other. The third difference is how they set direction. The diminishers tend to, to be know-it-alls. They set direction based on what they see, what they know, which means they tell people what to do. They operate in terms of directives. And if they're asking a question, it's like they're asking a question that they already know the answer to. And they don't ask questions beyond their own knowledge. And their knowledge becomes a limiting, it becomes a ceiling for what the organization can do. The multiplier tends to be a challenger. They operate not in directives, they operate in questions. You know, these leaders tell less and they ask more. And they give people challenges, stretch challenges. They invite people to explore possibilities they ask questions that they don't already have answers to, which invites people to think and to contribute and to innovate and to solve puzzles and problems around them. The fourth difference is how they make decisions. The diminisher tends to be a good decision maker. They make fast decisions and typically inner circle decisions and, and usually pretty good decisions that they then have to sell to the people around them. Whereas the multiplier tends to be not the decision maker initially, they're the debate maker. They're the ones that bring the right people together on the big weighty decisions. Now on the small decisions, they might be a bit of a dictator or you know, they delegate those, but on the big vital decisions, the ones that are going to affect the course of the organization, they bring people together, they frame it up. Here's what we're trying to decide. We're trying to decide, should we pursue A or B? We're trying to decide if we should do, you know, yes, should we do this? No, we shouldn't. And they lead the team in a hard-hitting debate that doesn't tear down the team. It actually ends up unifying the team. It's a debate where people aren't winners or losers. Ideas become winners or losers, and people then bond to those ideas. The last difference is how they, they execute or they drive for results. Uh, the Diminisher tends to be a micromanager. And we heard that word came up over and over. They, they operate in tasks and give people tasks to do rather than 
projects or initiatives to lead. The multiplier is an investor. They give other people ownership. And they also give them the accountability. Their leaders like um, John Chambers, when he was brand new to Cisco, he's there, um, he's taken the job as their chief executive officer. They're a young growing company. And he's making his first executive hire as CEO. And he hires a vice president to come into the company and run customer support. A man named Doug. And he says to Doug, Doug, when it comes to this part of the business, you get 51% of the vote and 100% of the accountability. And I just don't know a clear way. You know, we talk a lot about enabling people and empowering people, but I don't know a clear way to let someone know that they're empowered than to say, you kind of have power here. You get 51% of the vote. Like, I'll hold 49, consult me. Um, I'd like to participate, but you get it. So that's what we found. And we found that, these diminishing leaders get less than half of people's capability where the multipliers get virtually all. It's similar to the, what we saw on the poll results. So it, you know, it made me ask like, wow, what, what could you do if you could get all of this intelligence? What's happening in organizations? Where are their pockets where there are people holding back, being diminished? And, and what could you do to get more from people around you? What I've found is that as a leader, as a boss, as a manager, if you can create an environment where people give you all of their capability, it's great for you, it's great for the company, but it turns out to be pretty great for the contributor as well, because that's a good gig, um, where you get to be fully utilized, all of your talent capability um, used. And service is something important. Now. That's probably the first thing I found in the research. The second thing I found was a little bit more um, disturbing. In fact, a little bit upsetting, particularly if you're someone who, who fancies yourself as um, a good leader or even just a good person. Because here's what I found is that most of the diminishing that's happening in our workplaces is actually being done with the best of intentions. And it was very much like a movie where you go to the movie and there's a plot twist and you realize that the good guys might actually be the bad guys in the movie. You're like, oh, wow. Like I didn't see that coming and I didn't really see this coming either, that most of the diminishing that's happening is coming from what I call the accidental diminisher. And so I, it, and, the, and the bell curve looks a little bit like this. It's skewed to the diminishing side. And we find that of the diminishing behavior out in the workplace, this is a study that I actually, my research team and I did recently, is that 60% of the diminishing behavior or 34% overall is coming from the accidental diminisher, the well-intended leader, who's often just doing the thing they've been asked to do, doing, playing to their strengths in many ways. Um, let me give you an example. This is one of, this is one of my favorite interviews and really understanding how we can end up being an accidental diminisher and how we can turn that into a multiplier way of leading. Now, some of you might recognize this picture. My guess is this group might be a little young to have ever seen this person play basketball, but this is Magic Johnson, but this is him not when he is Magic Johnson. This is a, 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 a photo of when he's a young man and he is Irvin Johnson Jr. He's a young man growing up in the state of Michigan. Uh, he's playing for his high school basketball team, the Vikings, as you can see here. And he's a totally phenomenal athlete. He's a phenom. And I want you to imagine being his coach, being like his high school coach, or maybe imagine being one of his teammates. He's this incredible athlete, and he had this experience that he said really shaped the way that he, he led. His coach said to him, um, Irvin, every time you get the ball, I want you to, what would you guess? Um, I, I'd love to have some people take a guess. What did his coach say to him, Zach? Um, and feel free to take a guess yourself. Or maybe people have got their fingers on the keyboard and are going to chat in. What did his coach say? Urban, every time you get the ball, I want you to. What? 
we'll see what people come up with here, Liz. I don't know if there's a delay as people are thinking or there's some latency in the system. I think there is a couple seconds delay and then people need to, to type. Yeah. What did his coach say? Zach, you want to venture a guess? Um, I would I would say pass the ball um, would be my guess. Um, we have our first uh, reply from Julie, uh, create magic with it, which, uh, mm. which I, I like. I love that. I love that. Create magic with it. That's uh, beautiful. Julie, you should be a coach if you aren't. Um, Ashley has imagined the ball going through the net. Oh, that's beautiful too. This is like poetry and coaching. There's a lot of pressure on the next person who says something um, because those are actually really beautiful ideas. We have a, a one, another one I like, do what you do best. Do what you do best. So interesting. Here's what his coach said to him. And, and, and if you played high school basketball, you might know exactly what his coach said to him. And this is back in the late seventies. His coach said, Irvin, every time you get the ball, I want you to take the shot. Shoot is what his coach said. You get the ball, you take the shot. So he did. And his coach loves it because he's this, not only a super talented athlete, he's, he's coachable. Now the other players love it too. Now, why do they love it? They love it because they're winning. They're undefeated and, you know, they're winning every single game. And is there like a high school kid who doesn't want to be on an undefeated team? It's going up game after game. See, he, they would win with, let's say, um, 54 points and Urban would have scored 50 of those points. And there's one particular game and there's nothing special, not like a tournament game or a playoff game. It's just a game. They win. Team is celebrating. They're, now the players are leaving the gymnasium, headed to the parking lot with their parents to go home. And young Urban happens to notice the faces of the parents who of course came there to see their kid play. And what did they get? They got this, like, I don't know, I guess it was like an early version of Lakers Showtime magic. And, and it, he saw it and it affected him and he, he made a decision. He said, so he's a high school kid. He said, I decided that I would use my God given talent to help everyone on the team be a better player. So he reoriented from, okay, I am the star to I'm going to help everyone be a better player. And I think it captures the essence of this multiplier way of leadership because some people misinterpret this idea of being a multiplier. Oh, well, it's not about me. It's, it's just about my team. No, I think it's actually more like the way he played basketball, which is if you've ever seen him play, he played huge. He was this incredible athlete, gave it all he had. He played huge, but he played in a way that invited other people to play at their best. I think it also captures how easy it is for us to end up having a diminishing impact on others without realizing it, by just doing our thing, or in some ways being helpful and supportive, yet having a diminishing impact. I wanna share with you some of the ways that we see really well-intended leaders absolutely diminishing their team. So what, what I'd love to have you, I'm gonna share nine with you and I'm gonna um, share it with a set of pictures. Uh, you'll see a set of pictures that look like this. On the left, you'll see something that captures the leader's best intentions. And on the right, you're gonna see a picture that is my attempt to capture the effect they actually have on other people. So it's like the manager's intent versus the contributor's experience. As I show you these nine, I'd love to have you just pick one that you think might be your vulnerability, meaning might be your accidental diminisher tendency. Okay, thing you're doing with the best of intentions. The first is absolutely one of my vulnerabilities, which is I'm an idea guy and we love creative environments, innovative thinking. I love ideas. I am like a fountain of ideas. And of course, my intention, along with my idea guy, brothers and sisters, is to spark innovative thinking and to create 
like to start the party for getting new ideas out there. We're, we're like seeding ideas, but actually people say this is the experience they have around these um, idea guys. And let me see, I don't know that that little video played very well. Let me try this, see if that plays. Is that people end up running around chasing the boss's ideas. Okay, she's got me doing this, now she's got me doing that, now I'm doing this. And people end up learning to just stay put. You know, we become idea lazy around people who are really idea rich. Um, or what about this one here? What about the, the always on leader? This is the energetic leader. This is a person who's always present, always contributing, always something to say. And of course, they think their energy is infectious. Like they're getting the parade started. Like, woo! You know, they're like energizing their team, motivating their team. What people say is actually working around them is draining. It's exhausting. It's like you're killing me with all this energy. Um, I've got a little video here that that captures, I think, the universal reaction to these leaders. And I want you to... I'm, Stop and think, like, what do you do when you see an always on boss or colleague, that energizer bunny, when you see them coming down the hallway toward your office, coming up to your desk, what do you tend to do? See, most people do something like this, where, you know, their reaction is to like, you know, to hide, to avert your eyes, because they're people you often don't want to make eye contact with. Okay, that's the always on leader. What about the rescuer? Uh, maybe you're a bit of a rescuer. These are big hearted leaders. They love their people. They care about people. They want people to be successful. Of course, their narrative is they're saving someone who's stuck. But the experience that most people have around them feels more like the picture on the right where it's like you end up rendered helpless, even humiliated. Like what happens when a leader is helpful too early? or too often. Okay, what about the pace setter? The pace setter is the person who is, uh, they tend to be driven, achievement oriented. They are, they're leading by example. They're, they're modeling the way. Now I know you've been told to do that. I've been told to do this, but when we do that, I mean, it works great for ethics and values. It's a little bit trickier when we're modeling the way for certain behaviors, like, okay, well, we want more customer intimacy. And so I'm gonna go out as a boss and spend time in the field with customers. And other people, the people who work for me will notice what I'm doing. And of course they're going to follow. But we actually find that people don't tend to, I mean, they, they maybe trail better than they follow. They don't tend to speed to catch up. They tend to watch, see when we lead by setting the pace, we are more likely to create spectators than followers. And we find that people end up, like these bosses kind of run around their people. So let me see if I get this little video to play. And uh, it's a little gif here. Look at these, which of these two dogs do you think represents the boss in this case? Yeah, people are like thinking, hey, I'd love to help. Like, let me know if I can help next time you you lap me. Um, so it's maybe that kind of leadership or the rapid responder who um, it's like see a text, answer a text, see a bear, shoot a bear kind of way of, of working. Emails don't last long in their inbox. There are people who jump on things. They move fast. And of course, they think they're creating an agile team that can respond quickly. But what do you do? If the email note is sent to you, but it's copied to the rapid responder boss or colleague, what do you tell yourself? It's usually like, hey, you know what? He's going to get this. I don't want to get out of sync. I'll let him, I'll let him handle it. Um, and other people end up sort of sitting around around these kind of leaders. Or here's another one that gets me is optimist. And it's not a lack of optimism for me. It's too much optimism. Like I'm one of these positive, hopeful, can-do kinds of people who as a manager, <clears throat> I look at things that are hard and I'm like, we can do this. We can do hard things. But see, people like this sometimes end up 
demotivating rather than motivating. I've had someone say, Liz, you know, I know you keep saying this can't be that hard. We can do it. That we're smart. We can figure it out. See, here's the problem, boss, is what we're doing is actually hard. And as my manager, I need you to acknowledge it. See, sometimes we're so busy seeing the possibilities, the victory, that we overlook the struggle. And the people who work for you need to know that you know that they're struggling. And Liz, just want to let everyone know the next poll question is up and it's actually lets people check off um, which of these, and it's anonymous, of course, but you can check off which of these you identify with as your uh, accidental diminishing uh, qualities. Fantastic. And Zach, can people pick more than one? Or they, they can, have- yes. So as we go through, you can check as many as you'd like. But if you hit submit, then you I don't know if you'll be able to go back. So you may want to wait until we, we cover all, okay. all of them. Yeah. I've got a couple more. I'll go through these faster, three more fast. <clears throat> the protector. This is a person who, they don't even need to rescue people. They, <clears throat> they don't even let people get into trouble. Like, ooh, you know what? This is going to be a tough meeting. This is going to be contentious. I'll take it. I'll eat it. Or, ooh, you know what? You don't want to present to him. He's going to knock your knees out. I'll I'll take the lead on this one. And so they're protecting people from harm, sometimes from politics or, you know, um, difficult situations. And, but they become like a banyan tree in that they provide comfort and shade. But nothing really grows under these kinds of leaders. You often see a very large gap between their capability and the capability of their team. <clears throat> or the strategist, the visionary leader who paints... And I, I heard the word earlier, like cast a compelling vision, but maybe they do so much of the big thinking for the team that nobody else has to do that. That other people are just working in silos. These kind of leaders often like wonder, like why can nobody else see where we're going? Like maybe you should frame that picture, that vision, but let other people fill in some of those pieces. And here's our last option. And maybe you've gotten these just by the, the, the words in the polls act put out but the perfectionist and if you have perfectionist tendencies you probably already know it and the people who work for you probably know they surely know it too <clears throat> but you might not know what it's like to work for you you see this a plus in the making but the people around you see kind of the the slaughter the the um the red ink all over their work. I I hear this so much. People say, you know, working around that person, nothing I did was ever good enough. What are people going to do when all their work gets revised, upgraded, redone? Most people would learn to turn it in kind of incomplete and let the boss get that to the next level. Okay. So, um, Zach mentioned there's a poll there. Here's a quick shot at those um, accidental diminisher tendencies. And trust me, there are more. This is all I can fit on a page, really. And probably all we can process. So the question is, what might be your vulnerability? Could you take a moment to to, um, answer that poll? And then, Zach, when you think we've got, oh, I don't know, a good body of data... Tell us what you see. So it looks like we have a lot of rapid responders and a lot of perfectionists um, are especially coming through. Also, pace setter um, is coming through as well. Only only one person identifies with optimist, uh, or I guess over over optimist. <laughs> um, so I think uh, that seems to be the least right now, and more and more coming in for perfectionist. Mm. You know, and I should say, as these um, votes or the, the results are coming in, having these accidental diminisher tendencies does not make you a diminisher. It does not mean you're having a diminishing impact. What it means is that you are vulnerable to this. You're vulnerable to this. And, and if you're, I can't promise you you're having a diminishing impact, but I can almost guarantee you that if you are having a diminishing impact on your team, you're going to be the last one to know. Like they all know about this. They probably talk about it. Um, Let me offer, given that there's a rapid responder and perfectionist, I'm going to offer just two simple workarounds. Um, I've got a little rapid responder in me. 
one of the things I've learned to do is I've learned to have a waiting period. And for me, it's 24 hours. And what that means is if I receive a request, and let's say an email, and some people on my team are copied on that, and they really own it, this is their thing, or they could take this and run with it. I have a hands-off period for 24 hours, which means I'm not gonna respond to it. I'm gonna give them a chance to respond. 24 hours for me works great, it means you know, in case someone you know had to leave early or is in a meeting, like I'm gonna give them a full day to jump on that. But if they don't get on top of it, then I'm gonna kind of get on top of them a little bit. Like, okay, wait a minute, hey, this is yours and I'm handing it over to you. But that might be one thing you could do, set a little waiting period. If you have some perfectionist tendencies, um, here's a little something, it was a, a partner in law firm told me, he had perfectionist tendencies. People who go into law probably have a lot of this um, either orientation or they've been trained to do this. He said, when I became partner, it was so easy to want to like redo everybody's work. But when he became partner, he made a decision and a commitment to himself. He said, I told myself that I would only correct people's work if it was legally wrong. Like as if we would be giving out bad legal advice. He said, I decided not to upgrade people's work with, oh, well, this might be a better word choice or I like this font better. He focused on legal excellence. And he said it just allowed him to not have this kind of effect on his team because he didn't take his own perfectionism and sort of like apply it to every situation. Okay, um, has that poll changed at all or are we still in about the same place? We've gotten more responses, but the, the perfectionist is definitely leading the way followed by the rapid mm. responder. Now there is a little tool that um, we've sent out. It's this little, I, I kind of, sum up a lot of what I've learned about this into this chart. It has these accidental diminisher tendencies at the top. And it has along the, um, the rows, the, a, a number of what I call multiplier experiments. They're small multiplier practices and you can use those yellow check marks to help you find a multiplier practice that you can experiment with that might remedy that accidental diminisher tendency. So you might get started by identifying your accidental diminisher tendency. You might think, hmm, what triggers this? When I rescue someone, what's usually happening? When I go into can-do optimist mode, what tends to provoke that? That'll help you watch for it. And you might pick a multiplier experiment. So that's sort of getting started. I want us to leave us in our last few minutes here with, with three questions. First question is, how can I understand if I'm having a diminishing impact on my colleagues? So like you've answered that poll based on your own supposition. What do you think? What's your hypothesis? But if you really want to know, you should probably go ask. And there's some better ways to do this than others. Like if you go and ask, am I a diminisher? And <laughs> someone asked me, you know, if I asked my team that, no, it's not you. If I ask, am I an accidental diminisher? You know, I might not get an honest answer to that, but if I ask in what way might I be having a diminishing impact with the best of intentions, people can answer that question and they will. Or what you might want to do is you might want to actually take that piece of paper, print that out, take that piece of paper, circle what you see as your accidental diminisher tendency, and you might find a colleague there, this is option two, and say, hey, here's what I think I'm doing that could be accidentally diminishing. What do you see? You know, you might even hand them the paper and, and a pen and have them circle it and have a one minute conversation about this. You might go and ask a bunch of people. It'll help you see how your best intentions could be interpreted differently. How do I lead more like a multiplier? Question number two. Now you've got that handout there, or that document with a set of these. I want to quickly go through these. One thing that you might do is instead of giving answers, ask better questions. And you might choose to take what I call the extreme question challenge to help you kind of get yourself into this space of leading by asking rather than by telling. And you might take what I call the extreme question challenge, which is to go into a meeting or a conversation and to lead it with nothing but questions. I did this a little bit um, 
involuntarily about 15 years ago where I first tried this. So I was a, uh, had a big executive job at Oracle and I also had three small children at home. And I was talking to my buddy, Brian at work and telling him, man, I don't feel like a very good parent right now because I'm constantly just telling my kids what to do. I'm like, you should see bedtime at my house. It's like, kids, go to bed, leave her alone, put that away, get your pajamas on, go brush your teeth. Okay, you know, go back, use toothpaste, story time, get a book. No, not five books, give me one book. Okay, story time, done. Send your parents into bed, not my bed, not, you know, not her bed, back to bed. And, and it's not yelling, it's just this barrage of telling. And it's not working very well. And and Brian said to me, he goes, Liz, why not? Why don't you try just going home and asking your kids questions? Like, what if you just ask questions? And I initially dismissed this as a little bit of a ridiculous idea and that, you know, like I was going to be home at six. They didn't go to bed till 9.30. That was three and a half hours. And it was an entirely ridiculous concept. And then I got thinking about it and I decided it was really, really interesting and that I would give it a try. It, it changed me forever as a parent. And it really changed me as a leader. Because I only had questions and I had to learn to ask questions. Like when we got to bedtime, it's like, instead of like, hey, kids, time for bed. I asked, hey, kids, what time is it? They're like, well, it's bedtime. What do we do first? Where are your pajamas? Who needs help getting your pajamas on? Where do those toys go? Who needs help brushing their teeth? Okay, what story are we going to read? Who's going to read the story tonight? Mom or dad? <laughs> And, and like, what do we do after story time? Oh, mom, we say prayers. And then my final question was, okay, now who's ready for bed? And then it became a bit of a race to go into bed. I learned that when I asked the questions, it allowed other people to find answers. And this was such a profound shift for me that I decided that this is how I needed to lead at work as well. I've learned that what the people who work for me need is not an answer. They don't need me to tell them what to do. They're smart. They need me to ask an intelligent question. So you might try this experiment or you might go into a meeting where you tend to over contribute and say, you know what, each thing I say is going to be like a chip. And maybe I give myself four chips and I play fewer chips. Instead of playing big, I'm going to know when to play big and play a chip, but also when to play small and let somebody else contribute. Maybe I'm going to Instead of just hiring smart people, I'm going to look for their native genius. Instead of asking, are they smart? I'm going to ask, in what way are they smart? Instead of telling people to innovate and be creative, maybe the thing you do is help people see where to be innovative and where not. Like, here are the parts of our business, our operation, our work, where we can't make a lot of mistakes. And maybe even say, I might micromanage or be a little bit of a perfectionist there. But over here, these are playgrounds, not freeways. This is where we can try new things and risk. Making that delineation is way more powerful to your team than telling them to go be innovative. Maybe like Chambers, you tell someone that they get 51% of the vote. Instead of taking responsibility yourself, maybe you give that vote. Um, when people are struggling, maybe you help. But when we help, it's almost like We've taken the pen out of their hands and we are now in charge. Maybe you help, but you learn to hand the pen back. Okay, here's a little bit of help to get you unstuck. It's yours again, back to you. And you sort of metaphorically hand that pen back so that they're in charge. And lastly, instead of delegating work and tasks, maybe you give people stretch challenges, bigger challenges. Um, I think we are, we are, we're definitely at our time here. I'm gonna skip this third question um, and really maybe just leave with this idea that the best leaders don't just play the role of genius. They play the role of genius maker. They use all of the, the genius that they have, but they use all of the genius of their team and people give them their best thinking. They do their best work for them and they build deep capability and they build optimism, not in the leader, they build optimism across the team. Zach, if we have time, we can show that video or if there's questions that have queued up, I'm happy to do that. And I know I just left us three minutes. Yeah, why don't I play the video? If anyone has questions, we might be able to take one or two, they can enter that in. Um, I'll queue up the video here.
be fine. Have fun. I'll do it. Well. And I should say, this is Zia. She's 10 years old. And this is her first time going down I guess. the the Olympics, the 40 meter Olympic speed jump in Park City, Utah. Do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Just keep it straight, and you'll be fine. Do okay. Thing you do on this morning. Straight. Do you go faster on the end run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Oh, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. A bigger 20. I got it. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. Time freaks yeah. you out. That's the only thing, it's so fun! Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! So, you know, she ends with 60 seems like nothing now. I think that little video captures what it's like when you work in an environment where people create safety, but then they also stretch people. It gives us a chance to do our best work, to learn, to grow, and to feel that exhilaration. Um, any questions or anything as we uh, as we wrap here? Um, we've got a couple questions here. We'll probably only be able to get to one or two. Um, uh, just a, a few people have asked about the handout. Um, that's just in the in the resources section. People should just be able to click a, that link to download. Um, if anyone has has trouble with that, um, just just enter a question, and we'll be sure to get that sent to you. But that should be be right there for everyone. Um, uh, one person has asked, um, "How can you break through a culture where people um, prefer to be silent than speaking and risk being wrong?" Um, is intentionally asking dumb questions to break the ice effective, or is it demeaning? Oh, I love this question. You know, people learn behavior, and sometimes it's a, a problem when people come in as new leaders, and everyone's learned to play it safe. Uh, you know, trust has to be built in little layers. You've got to rebuild to trust. You've got to create safety. I would recommend um, Dr. Amy Edmondson's book on um, the fearless organization. Multipliers will help you on this as well. But I would focus probably, I would start by talking about my own mistakes. And I would talk about the things I've done and screwed up and lived to tell. And I wouldn't necessarily make it all about me, but when you do that, people are learning, oh, you can make a mistake. Um, I also might practice the five second rule, which is to ask a question and then wait five seconds for people to, to jump in, but rebuild trust layer by layer, make it safe for people to make a mistake. And also I would focus on creating, here's a place where it's okay to fail, here are the place where it isn't. So you're letting people know these are playgrounds and it's okay to screw up inside here. And you might show how you screwed up inside of some of those. What else? Um, just to note, a few people are saying they're having trouble with the something is, is wrong with the handout link. So the, this recording will be available and we'll have the handout. We'll, we'll get that figured out for the recording. Um, so just check back once that's up in the next 24 hours or so. So sorry about that for the people who are um, having trouble downloading it, but that, that will be available for everyone. Um, and then in terms of other questions, maybe we can take um, just one more. Um, Someone's just wondering if you can expound a little bit, and I know you touched on this, of if you if you work for a diminisher, whether they're accidental or 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 that's just they're they're, they're all the way there, um, what's the best way to maybe get them thinking about some of these ideas? Mm, I would ask you to just look at the little slide I have up. That was, I'm sorry, I ran out of time for 
how do I deal with the diminishers in my workplace? You know, um, the Multipliers book is on its second edition. And the reason why um, I did a second edition was because I wanted to answer this question. So many people have been asking like, yeah, this is great. I want to lead like a multiplier, but the reality is I work for a total diminisher. And so it's, I mean, it's like, it's hard for me to cope with that, let alone lead differently. So I did a whole another round of research, look at what are the best practices for dealing with diminishers. And there's a chapter in the book. Now you don't have to go out and buy this book. I feel so strongly that people should have tools for dealing with the inevitable diminishers in the workplace that I love to give away this chapter to anyone who asks, you can just request it. I think it's on our website, multipliersbooks.com, but if not, send an email to info at the group.com and we will get you this. Just ask for the dealing with diminishers chapter. We'll give it to you. I can sum it up in two words. And then I want to share a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that the two words are multiply up. We find that most people respond to diminishers by judging them with drawing from them, keeping them out of meetings, arguing with them. And what I find is in almost every case, it just exacerbates the diminishing. But when you respond to a diminisher with multiplier mindsets and behaviors, it doesn't magically change them, but it absolutely changes the dynamic. And there's 13 strategies in this chapter for how to do that. But I, I think this is best captured in this beautiful idea from Dr. Martin Luther King. We celebrated his, his, um, his birth just this week. And I'll just let people read it. You know, he says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that, is how he concludes this thought. Zach, any other questions? You know, there, there are several, Liz, but I know we're five minutes over, so I think we'll have to have to call it a day. Um, but thank you so much, Liz. This was very insightful. Um, really appreciate um, having your, your thoughts. Um, and um, again, we'll get the handout figured out for the recording, which will be available um, on the on the site, and people can check out um, future webinars also on the uh, the same site people came to today to uh, to register for the events. Um, so thanks everyone, and thanks Liz, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. And Zach, I will add if anyone has a question that didn't get answered, info at thewisemangroup.com, and I will respond to you personally. Great, thank you okay. so much, Liz. Th thanks for having me. Bye.